We're live. Hello, everybody. So excited to see you here. Welcome all learners and students. This is our very first ever. Hey. This is our- So excited to see you here. Welcome all learners and students. This is our very first ever. Hey. This is our- So excited to see you here. Okay, we're gonna plug in some headphones and try that again. We have a little reverb. Um, okay, welcome to our first high school edition of Explorer Classroom. I'm Kim Young, I'm your host today. I'm a high school social studies teacher and National Geographic Education Fellow, and I'll be your host for today. Um, we are lucky to be talking to one of my very favorite people, Tomas Ayasu, who is joining us live from Honduras. Tomas is an award-winning documentary photojournalist and writer. This includes being the 2019 recipient of the James Foley Award for Conflict Reporting from the Online Journalism Awards. His work focuses primarily on Latin America and is absolutely amazing. I can't wait for you guys all to see what he has in store for you with his photography. Um, I also want to send some shout outs. We have classrooms joining us today from Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Colorado, New York, and Florida. We also have students joining us all the way from Mexico and Canada. A couple special shout outs. So we've got some students joining us from Iowa and Ms. Han um, Ms. Hansen's Latinx studies class. Welcome, you guys. We also have students from Woodgrove High School. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. And finally, I want to give some shout outs to the students from Kingswood, Lexington, Georgetown, and Torrington. They have been studying migration all year long through Out of Eden Learn, and they are joining us today. And also one final special shout out to my students from Weston High School. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, as a reminder, this event was designed for high school students. So if you're joining us today with younger learners and you're already not familiar with some topics surrounding migration or familiar with Tomas's work, you may want to exit this live stream right now and check out some of the pre recorded content we have on the National Geographic Education YouTube channel for middle school and younger learners. One final special shout out we want to appreciate all of those amazing teachers out there. Um, this week on Explore Classroom, we are celebrating Teacher Appreciation and Awareness um, Week by recognizing all the amazing teachers across the globe. Your work has never been more important or more apparent. This Teacher Appreciation Week, we are here to say, we see you and thank you for all that you do for your students, for your fellow educators, and for your communities each and every day. From all of us at National Geographic Society, thank you. And we are so proud to support you. Okay, it is time to get started, Tomas. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Going slideshow play from start okay people joining me on the zoom call you can see it it looks good okay Tomas take it away tell us about some all of your work and all of, that you've been up to all right uh, can you hear me all right yes great well thank you Kim thank you students uh, educators and everyone on the stream and this is wonderful this is an incredible opportunity so I'm Tomas Ayuso, and some of the work that you'll see here is part of the Right to Grow Old, a series of stories that tell the, you could say this, that I, my point was to narrate this series of crises that have led to Honduran displacement. My background before this was covering Latin American conflict, namely in Honduras, Central America, and uh, Colombia with focus on the drug war and urban dispossession, mostly as it pertains to forced displacement. Originally, I worked with, uh, I, was, I went to school in the US. Uh, I lived there for over a decade and my track wasn't to be a journalist. I was planning to work in places like the UN or likely uh, as, a, as a teacher myself or a professor at university, but life kind of got in the way and i had to come back to honduras where i kind of i didn't know what what i was going to do i was a little bit lost to be honest and 
in the process, I thought that given my my skill set, which is conflict analysis, and at the time Honduras being steeped in a conflict of its own, I thought that I could translate these skills. And at the same time, I noticed that there was uh, that the only, for the most part, the only sources, the only record that was being kept of the crisis that was happening in Honduras, the worst probably in our history, was being, was being written and recorded by uh, journalists from outside the country in languages outside of Spanish. And this was, I felt, it felt wrong because I felt that they, it, they weren't getting the gist of it. They weren't getting this, the particular textures of Honduran identity and uh, the, the reasons why a lot of it was being, I felt glossed over. So I, I thought, hey, you know what? I'll, I'll try to use my skill set and write what I think is what's a more accurate portrayal of the Honduran crisis. And in doing so, it was, uh, I, felt, I felt, to be honest, a bit of an uphill battle. And that's when I borrowed my sister's camera, which four years later I haven't returned. And that's my bad. Uh, I decided I'll give a, sh I'll try to make this work with a, with photography and a few years of self teaching later, uh, I was able to now be able to speak with you and the, my photog my lens, if you will, just naturally, uh, gravitated towards the, the, the smaller moments that happen in greater events. So there was this big mass displacement of Hondurans across or Central Americans across borders. And the most of often the way that this was portrayed, it was just thousands and thousands of people cluttered in checkpoints and borders. And but what happens in those, in those tiny moments, like when they're tired, such as this moment with Adriana and her partner, when they were just had reached the border and they were exhausted. And what happens, which is my greater philosophical question that I ask, what happens to a person's identity when confronted with such difficult and complex, overwhelming uh, phenomenon, such as mass displacement and all the different reasons why these people left. And by focusing on identity, and focusing on Hondurans, and as here, this man, he wears on his chest the tattoo catracho, which, was, which is the way we call ourselves. It's our demonym. It's our slang term to refer to ourselves. And in his, in his abs, he wears the Honduran shield. That identity is carried with us, and an identity and what we carry with us when uh, or these people who are forced into extreme circumstances carry with them is not things of value or, you know, of physical material value, but of a more spiritual and intangible value, such as their loved ones, their kids, their family, and their partners. And if you go into this next section, Kim, I can talk about how I went into developing the right to grow old into a project that is in its current form right now. So when I started, this is one of the first pictures I took of the right to grow old. When I started to realize that the mass displacement of Hondurans, Hondurans wasn't happening in the right way. And I found, I found myself replicating the same issues that I was criticizing. Um, I found, I traveled the, the migrant path as it's called, from Honduras to the U.S. border that these two youths were uh, seeing for the first time, the, the whole extent of the 2,000 kilometers they were going to have to walk. And if, you, if you're wondering where they are on the map, they are uh, right at the Guatemalan border. So they have the entirety of Mexico to walk. I had to, um, I traveled with them. I traveled on the trains, traveled on the buses, traveled on foot and uh, just found that it wasn't, yes, this was part of it, definitely, but this was just something that was, that was often repeated. And I felt that spending more time with the people who were, 
who were traveling, who were living these experiences was more important. More was, or no, not rather more important, but would provide new knowledge that wasn't exactly shown, particularly why they left, how the journey looked and where, what the outcome was, such as this boy um, who's, who's the, the, those are the feet of a 16 year old boy. I believe that he was, had just turned 16 and had walked 31 days. Um, so it isn't just the identity that changes physically, the journey changes you as well. And so I, I you know, at first I, I like I said, I was tra traveling with these people and, and seeing how they're different stories, but I, I just felt that it wasn't all there. The whole story wasn't there. I wasn't capturing the, the totality of, of, of their, of this, of this life changing uh, event that they were going through. So I felt that it was important to focus on one story and, um, and that's when I decided to change the, the, the structure of, this, of, the, of the right to grow old into focusing on specifically families and individuals. Those of whom um, answer different questions. Uh, not just answering, oh, people leave Honduras because of violence, people leave Honduras because of uh, poverty, or people leave Honduras because of political, uh, you know, persecution or racism. It's all of these, and specifically some of these more to some people and less to other people. And it was, I wanted to reflect as much complexity, as much complexity that I saw in the migrant journey into the work and, as, and adding as many layers and reflecting as, as accurately and, and realistically as I could and bring this to the reader and to the people with whom I, I am having a conversation with. Uh, the, the stories that people such as Robbie, who you're seeing here on the screen right now, when he, the day that he finally made it to Times Square uh, after years of, of a very difficult life, to bring you the story of him to you so you could understand ideally what it is, what it is like to, to endure something such as forced displacement. And I believe the next one, Kim, is Moises, yes. So to illustrate this, let me, I want to talk to you about a specific story of uh, Moises. This is a, I met him when he was 17, I believe. And he was um, living in the city of San Pedro Sula, which um, I don't know how familiar you are with Honduran geography, but it is along the northern coast. It is an extremely hot city in more ways than one. And it is a city that it sprawls kind of like, like Phoenix. It just, and it never ends. He lived at the outskirts. And this is where some of the more the the problems were, were that you see coming out of Honduras happened the most. The the blurry edge between the rural and the urban. This is this is where he lived lived. And when I met him, he was kind of in an, in an existential crossroads of, of he was being courted by the gangs. He was was there was not a lot in the way of a future for him in terms of of work, uh, he had dropped out because education in Honduras at the time, specifically public education wasn't doing all that right, all that well rather. And he didn't know what to do. His friends had joined uh, gangs such as these boys and he kept kind of going back and forth because he knew what was at stake as well. If you join these groups, there was a high likelihood that there, there would not, there would be a violent end. And his parent, his father and his mother, uh, who were, his mother uh, worked in a, had a tortilla uh, mill in her, in the backyard and his father worked in construction, um, kept telling him, please baby, don't, don't do this. Just, you, 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 it's not gonna end well. And during this, he uh, met, um, his girlfriend or his uh his sweetheart and she uh the same reasons they were you know they loved their neighborhood they loved their friends they loved their family no one ever wants to leave 
but as this picture exemplifies, as um, this uh, this boy was mourning his brother Leo, who had been uh, mis uh, it was a case of mistaken identity, and uh, he was lost forever. They knew what was uh, what was almost inevitable, or feels inevitable, if they stayed. Here's Moises' father telling him, "Please, just one of the days that he he told him to stay." Uh, as you can see, there is just there's a generational difference between them. Like the the farming uh, background that his father comes from just didn't resonate with Moses. So um, they this uh, this was the night that uh, Moses' partner Maya uh, told him that she was pregnant. Uh, Moses had to take uh, make a decision, and they decided, knowing full well that if they stayed, their lives could be at risk, that they would leave. And uh, here, the, the question of why people leave is a multi-textured one. It's not just leaving because of gangs. It was leaving because there was, there, uh, their neighborhood had not, had not had any kind of employment opportunities for decades. They're, they were completely defranchised uh, from, from life as Hondurans. Uh, education had failed them due to corruption and all, all manner of different things that had defunded the schools. And of course, violence uh, within and without the community made, made it into life being there a pressure cooker for all. So in Moises's mind and Maya's mind, it was this high level existential calculus that no one should ever be making, especially not anyone of, that, of their age, um, but they did and they chose to leave because they did not have a choice. So once their daughter was uh, born, they made preparations, they packed up. Um, and the only thing they packed up was baby supplies, really. No, no clothes, no, uh, for them mostly just a couple of changes for, for the colder environments of Mexico. And uh, the, the rest was just uh, baby formula and diapers. Um, they were traveling to seek asylum in the United States, as they knew that um, the United States is the place where they would be safe. Uh, and after all, that is their goal. They need, that is the right to grow old, which is, you know, just a, a nice way, a poetic way of saying everyone has a right to life and they chose to fight for this right. So as they were leaving, um, saying goodbye to their parents, which they don't know if they're ever going to see them. They could be deported or worse on the, on the way. Or if they're of the lucky few, they can make it to their destination and they'll never come back. And this is the last time they will physically have their loved ones in their hands. And so on the way, they went through Guatemala. I remember one of the things, and Guatemala has highlands that are very cold at times. Maya, uh, telling me, this is the first time I've ever felt cold. This was low 70s. She had just never left her city. This is how much of a, a restriction, how restrictive this neighborhood was. And it, it, it stayed with me. And they traveled and they made it all the way to the Mexico border. At the time, I couldn't enter Mexico due to political reasons. And I was overwhelmed because I, 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 I felt the same thing that the uh, Moises' dad felt in the previous picture. And I told him, hey, you know what? Just keep in touch. And as soon as I'm able to go into the country, I'll go in and follow you. And a month passed and I heard nothing. I thought the worst, what you do in times like these. And after a month, suddenly uh, in my heart, ringing and wrenching out uh, wherever I was, I got a WhatsApp message and it was Moises. I said, oh my God, you're alive. What, what happened? Where are, what, where are you? Just completely beside myself. And he tells me, oh man, I lost the phone. So we had a good laugh. Uh, and the next day I boarded a plane to go see them. And they had, they had made it to the border. Um, at the border, they were fine. They were exhausted, but they were fine. They were a little bit skinnier, a little bit more tanned, but the baby was 
uh, somehow even chubbier because as parents, they did everything so that on the journey, as harrowing and difficult as it is, she was okay. And I asked them, how did you make this? And to quote them, by God and love. And currently they're, they're uh, still at the border. Um, the old manner of different situations that have taken place, global crises and crises at the border have made things difficult for them to move on. Um, the asylum process has been complicated a little bit, and, but they're together. And they say, as long as we're together, that's what matters. And that's when I realized that really, truly, that in displacement, a lot of things can change that I can get more into detail in the, in the question. Uh, what matters the most is that they were able to stay together, uh, be able to feed each other and work. And then they do this all because to, I believe, uh, no matter how, difficult to get it's through their love that they can able they're able to accomplish anything and i know that might sound a little bit you know emo, uh, sentimental but uh, you need s strong motivations to keep going to go through what they did and i believe their motivator was absolutely definitely the loving bond that comes with being born and having a family that only you have. Kim? Hello? Hey there, do you want me to go to the next one? No, yeah, I, know. I think uh, I, I hit the, for that, that is for the extent of that uh, going over. Um, that I think that uh, that bit sums it up uh, on my end, like what I wanted to do with this presentation to show the one chapter of of what uh, the the right to grow, but in general terms to elaborate upon what it meant for the what uh, hum uh, Honduran displacement is. This is just one story of those. Okay, I don't know if this, yeah. students have these questions. Thank you so much for that, Tomas. Um, I think those, I don't know what you guys thought, but those pictures are so compelling and so amazing and tell not just the individual story in that moment, but with so many other stories. I was also struck a lot thinking about, you know, the stories we hear versus the stories we don't hear. So for those of you guys who are joining us on YouTube, if you can start sending your questions in the chat, those of you guys who are joining me live on Zoom, in a second, I'll start kind of alternating between online questions, but also reach out to you to see if you have any uh, questions for Tomas and we'll turn on your microphones um, to give you a chance. But before we get started with the online questions, I'm gonna throw you a curveball, Tomas, one I didn't, a question I didn't prep you with, but just to give people a little bit of think time. And I don't think it's a question other people are gonna ask. It's Teacher Appreciation Week. And so I wanna know, is there any teacher that stands out to you from your memory that really inspired you or as a teacher that you'll kind of always remember um, or you think about either in your current career, past career, or as a kid? Uh, that, te that taught me? Yes, like an inspirational teacher from your life. Okay. Uh, one that immediately comes forward was my college uh, poetry teacher because I, I was one of my, one of my majors was creative writing uh, in, a, in addition to, you know, the political economy thing uh, was he uh, really was the one who uh, compelled me to not ignore the creative impulses that I had uh, in college. He told me just to, to really foster them. He uh, cared a lot for the type of output that I was able to do. Um, and the school that I went to in Honduras, high school and primary school, there was not a lot of that type of uh, feedback, but uh, Dr. Jeffrey Rosner uh, was kind enough to share his insights, uh, motivate me, and gave me one of uh, kind of like a, a foreshadowing, if you will, of my life. And he said, told me, I asked him the last day of, of graduation, I asked him, hey, what's, uh, do you have any advice for me? Like, I look, looking for some uh, life advice at the, at the last day of college. He said, uh, travel light. And I said, do you mean like 
just like no luggage and he said no like uh in your endeavors just keep a level head and you will make it through any adversity and uh you know 15 whatever however many years later i've done that and the people who know me i do actually travel light just with a backpack but also uh in order to do this job i was it was something that i've held on to so yeah, dr roger is, thank that's you that's great yeah a big thank you to him and that's some great advice so we have our first question from a student online. This question is from Janice, um, a really thoughtful question that's really connected to your presentation. Have you found that people's identity changes a lot as they go through hard events such as migration? Yes, absolutely. Um, to, sometimes to a lesser degree and sometimes to a harder degree, sometimes for with positive outcomes and sometimes with negative outcomes um sometimes due to trauma and sometimes due to uh relative success and identity changes for for many different reasons some of which i mentioned right now and some of some of them being more for survival reasons such as you know you cross a border you need to hide your identity especially in these days where uh being a foreigner sometimes in different countries can be uh unwelcome and uh they have to out of necessity behave a, a different way but in their core they they stay the same in fact i would say that once you leave your country just keeping with the honduran sense the memory and the love for Honduras just ev grew even larger when they realized that how awful it was to leave something that you loved so much, your, your community, your people. And so this identity of being Honduran, this Hondurenness just grew more. And for other people for whom Honduras was a negative experience, a traumatic experience, and for whom the journey was a traumatic one, for any number of reasons, they they turn away from from these events and uh, they never look back. Um, some, when they make it to say the United States, they give themselves fully into America and embrace that identity, a hundred percent. Others uh, find it hard and remain the same. So it's it's yeah. the constant that I found is that identity changes. Thank you so much for that. So we have uh, now excited to turn it over to a learner who's joining us live on Zoom. So Tiger from Oregon, go ahead and unmute. There, I got you unmuted. Go ahead and ask Tomas a question. So at the beginning of your presentation, you were talking about uh, how some people get involved with gangs. Uh, how do you follow that without getting too close to anything? dangerous uh well you recognize what the dangers are and you set your own your own well i set my own uh parameters and i follow them, you know so like sometimes these these uh um they are criminals obviously they are doing bad things if you want to call it that uh, to put a name on that so you, I make a decision, an ethical decision, not to participate in that. My interest in them isn't partic exactly as gang members as much as who they are when they're not being gang members. You know, as as we contain multiple identities ourselves, they are at the same time gang members and also neighbors and also brothers, cousins, husbands, and uh, instead of just focusing on the gang part of things I focus on who they are as, as people and maybe that can answer me the question of why they became gang members but you know I had this question I, I asked it to a uh, associated press editor at, and one time and I asked him it's like uh, the actually the exact same question that you asked me and he said you have to choose how far you want to go because it can lead to a good story and a good picture but ultimately you're going to have to deal with that memory for the rest of your life if you see something awful. So, you know, that goes into the question of journalistic integrity and, and, and ethical uh, standards. And I think uh, while there is a universality to it, I have my own very strict 
uh, ethical codes that I follow. And there's some lines that I will definitely not follow. We have a question. Or, or rather, lines not to cross, rather. Yes. Another question from a student who is joining us online. This question is from Nikki. How long does it take you to find the right moment to capture pictures? How much time during the day is spent taking photos? Wow, that is a wonderful question. Um, because uh, I, I tell uh, other photographers, because this is a question photographers ask, this is not just like a question um, anyone asks. So uh, perhaps the student who asked this question has a future in photography. Uh, and there's no way of knowing. There's absolutely no way of knowing. Sometimes you know that there's a, you have a certain vision that you want to reflect, which is like, I don't know, like a lighting condition or something like that. But say for like those, some of those instances uh, in the presentation or in the pictures that you saw, some of them are very intimate or like just they last a fraction of a second and then they're done and you have no way of predicting you. Uh, the best thing that you can do and actually the only thing that you can do in my, in my mind is uh, spend as much time with the people who you, you're covering. This is the difference. This is, this is, and this is afforded to me by being a freelancer with, and self-funded for the most part or uh, through grants and other things that allows me to stay with people and not exactly follow deadlines. Um, and meaning that I can stay like, say with Moises, I can stay with him a month and a half. Uh, they, they like me, I like them, we're comfortable with each other. And then I'm there, I was there when say Maya was washing uh, the food on the faucet on the side of a highway uh, or in the earlier picture seeing the man holding the woman in the car you know they were comfortable with me joining them to go to the hospital so I would say that you never know and therefore time is your biggest resource thank you so much for that up next we're again join Kate H who's joining us from Virginia and who's live on the zoom call Kate go ahead and speak up and ask Tomas a question so in the beginning, you talked about how there are a lot of um, people not from Honduras that are um, writing about what's happening there. Would you have any recommendations as to how they could improve upon what they're currently writing about and how it could um, give more, shed more light on what's really happening there? Yes, absolutely. Uh... And I think that the, the easiest way is to uh, to speak with local journalists and really make sure that everything is being uh, that that's there is you know at least essentially correct. Not having as not asking local journalists to rewrite their articles per se, you know, but rather to hey, uh, here's the idea. This is what I'm doing. Boom, boom, boom. And let's say the local journalist says, hey, actually, that sounds a little bit overboard and over exaggerated, you know, uh, or uh, just uh, spending a lot of time again in the place, like say if they're covering Honduras, if they moved here or spend some time here, which is not something that everyone has a chance to do. But if they can spend more time here, speak with different people to get a sense of the country, it changes a lot. You know, which is not to say that anyone from outside of Honduras can't cover Honduras or anyone from who's not Mexican can't cover Mexico, but there is a certain responsibility that comes with when you're an outsider covering a uh, local community's uh, situation. And this also goes for me, you know, I had to earn the trust and understand Moises's community because I'm not from there in order for me to write about it and photograph about it. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, just asking questions, under, uh, understanding that you're not from the place and uh, having the people who know the, the, the situation best to tell you, the, answer the questions you may have and have them tell you what they think about the, uh, of what you intend to do. We have a question from Anthony online that's along this, it's kind of totally building on what you were just talking about, um, but from a little bit more of a, from your perspective um, question. So Anthony asks, did you ever feel like an outsider coming in and documenting these specific families or people? 
um, or were you always accept, accepted into their homes? You know, just a little bit more specifics. Mm -hmm. Like how do you gain people's yeah. trust to really photograph them in this mm -hmm. much more personal way? Yeah. Well, there is there when people are very sensitive to to uh, hello, am I there? Yep, yes. I can hear you. Uh, oh, some some uh, never mind. So um, so people are very sensitive to how they're how you perceive them, like they are, and people are very sensitive to the fact that if you're a journalist or a photographer or someone from the outside who comes in essentially to take a story, take a picture and leave. So they're, they're gonna understand that uh, instantly. Um, I've, I've seen this uh, from everywhere that I've photographed. So there's no need, there's like no point in hiding and trying to outsmart people or trying to do anything like that. The, the only thing there is to do is just to be genuine uh, one with your motives and intentions and also just be a general uh, a genuine person a normal regular human being uh, who and treat them with respect and dignity as they um, so deserve and so what I do is like when I go to uh, a, a certain community yes I, I meet them through a intermediary or I meet them on my own and I realize that they have a good story to tell and that it's just something that's reflects a greater crisis in the country or uh, political situation, for instance. So I speak with them, I tell them my, my situation and I don't even take my camera or my notebook out for the longest time. You know, sometimes even uh, missing out, let's say on a picture or uh, a moment that would be important, but just to earn their trust and to, so that they feel comfortable. Because I feel that if they're not comfortable and if they don't, trust me, uh, there's no reason to even do this. The, the product or the output of anything that I do is just not going to reflect the reality. It's going to be uh, done under some duress. So um, it's always a matter of trust, respect, and kindness, I feel. And, and if it's a, 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 a traumatic story or event that is happening, uh, quite a great deal of empathy. That is fantastic advice for life and in art and in everything. Um, next, I want to welcome Ashlyn from Kentucky, who's with us on the Zoom call. Do you have a question for Tomas? A lot of these displaced migrants. Sorry, we had we still had you on mute. Can you start again? Sorry, Ashlyn. Now I am. Um, yep, go for I it. I was. Uh, wondering how does the current situation with like the pandemic affect some of these displaced migrants? Great question. Uh, great question. And hi, Ashlyn. She was hi. in a photo camp, I thought. Uh, so it's um, actually I just I just released an article through National Geographic that was uh, linked in the student guide, right, uh, Kim? Is that what it was called? Yes, it was. So if people yes. want to check that article out, we'll I'll tweet it out. We'll have get, but it's also available in the guide for this event. Yeah. So uh, Ashlyn, in that specific uh, article, I sought to answer that exact question. So some of these uh, people I've been following for the the, the project, I um, I call them up since I can't leave and visit them. And asked them like, "Hey, what are you guys up to? What's happening?" And for the ones in the U.S., it really depends on the state. Um, so the family in Indiana is having a really tough time. Um, they had, from what I understand, there's not been a lot of support. Uh, in fact, they believe that they've been infected by the virus. But um, and then in Los Angeles, the family there. Uh, the, the, the city government has been of great support to uh, asylum seekers and is helping them in, uh, with, a, with a wealth of access to food banks and different stipends to help them out. And as for uh, Moises, the family at the border, um, they've 
had trouble because uh, since it's the border it really depends on commerce with the U.S. and since the border has kind of been shut down, there has been a, a massive slowdown. And this can be said about all the families that uh, work is just dried up. And uh, so it's been tough. It just it it's it adds more weight and more problems to people who are already overburdened and uh, stretched thin. But even then, to quote one of them, if we've made it this far through all of the things they've gone through, they'll make it through the pandemic so far. So resilience lives and hope lives eternal. Fantastic, I mean, such a powerful message. You know, if you've made it this far, <laughs> resiliency is the kind of what it all comes back to. Um, our next question comes from another um, student who's on our, the Zoom call with us. So could the representative from Miss Lee's class, I've unmuted you. Um, you are unmuted. Oh, go ahead, ask the question. Um, so how has your like view on the world changed since you like went to Honduras and like experienced like what was happening there? Well, I am from Honduras. Um, oh, you mean like after I, I came back from the U.S.? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that is a great question because that ties in to um, uh, the question of identity because my identity had changed so much after living in New York for so long. You know, I had completely changed. Everything had changed about me. I consider myself an American. Look, just listen to the way I speak, uh, you know, and I almost even forgot how to speak Spanish. Like I spoke it like like I see, you know, like a little bit of uh, like kind of un poquito, but like really I only spoke English. So when I came back, it was a culture shock, even though it was my own culture, because I left so young. I think I was like a day over 16. And so it was kind of, it's been a process um, to uh, kind of marry these two different identities. The, American Tomas, if you will, and the Honduran Tomas. And now this is the, the product, just a little bit. Uh, now I have, you know, white hairs. That's the only thing that's really changed and uh, a little bit uh, sillier, but no, everything's, everything's changed for the better. But I went through a similar process of being, of facing something similar to a deportation and, uh, traveling through borders. It's, it, it is difficult, so, um, but I'm happy to say that my changing identities, even though it went through a rough spell, it was uh, ultimately one that had a, a positive outcome. Thank we've you. Had, we've had so many fantastic questions um, from the students and there's still a couple more from online that unfortunately we won't have a chance to get to, but they are some amazing questions. So I have, a, but I have a couple of questions for you, Tomas, to kind of wrap this up. Um, the first one is um, kind of how can students get involved with your work or kind of inspired by your work? What is kind of, um, we had kind of talked about a photo challenge um, to you post something for them to kind of based on what they've heard, if they want to go out um, and start doing some photography with their phones or in their own lives, yeah. what's something you, uh, kind of a challenge you can pose to them? I, okay, so for a challenge regarding photography, uh, I'm going to challenge you the same way that I challenged myself when I first stole my sister's camera, which is take a picture a day, post it on Instagram, and write a good story about it. Tell a little story, because I used to say, and I still believe, Instagram is your own newspaper. No one can edit it. No one can tell you nothing. You can do whatever you want. It is your space to write and self-reflect, which is if you go to my Instagram, that's all I do to this day, you know, four years after I started. So, you know, in, I, like uh, I only started taking pictures four years ago and Instagram was how I started. I would recommend you guys to go out there specifically right now because you and everyone in this chat is uh, being affected by a worldwide crisis, a, a historical event of once in a generation magnitude, all these different superlatives that you can add. So why not see how this is affecting you and your family, you and your community, you and your classroom, 
uh, and make uh, so you can have a record for the future generations to see how people your age of your generation coped with this very difficult times. And since what I understand, Kim, is that everyone is from all over the place, uh, if using the hashtag that Kim will tell you, right? Yep, I'm pulling it up right now. Okay, yep, goes yeah, right and, put it up now. And in using that hashtag, like, I'll be able to see it, you know, and we can talk about it if you want. And we can just make this can be a challenge to yourself. And if you uh, take every day and fully take a very committed picture every day, uh, we might end up listening to you in five to 10 years on the next uh, Explorer Classroom. Yes, so we really do want this to be a start of a larger conversation and engagement for the rest of this week. Um, check out the student guide. Please tweet us at Nat Geo Education and using the hashtag Explorer Classroom. We want to see, hear your thoughts and see the work that you come up with after this um, session today. Also follow Tomas on Instagram. We've got his handle up there. Um, we have an event coming up next week with um, Dr. Lo Song Rabge. She is a social innovator. So same time, but next Wednesday, we hope if you're interested, you can sign up um, and hang out with us next week as well. Um, some final thank yous and things to close out. Um, that's all the time we have, but remember to subscribe um, to the YouTube channel so you can get updates about videos and also check out natgeoed.org slash explorer classroom. So you can see more upcoming broadcasts and register if you guys got to see, you know, some students were with us today and were able to ask questions on screen, sign up now so you maybe can get one of those spots um, too. I wanna to say a huge thank you to Tomas for sharing his inspiring work and a thank you to all of the teachers who joined today's teacher, um, today's Explorer classroom. We see you being teacher strong. If you'd like to chat with other educators in our community, feel free also to tweet um, us about this Explorer classroom using the hashtag teacher strong and join us for our next teacher, uh, teacher strong Twitter chat this Sunday. Um, I am going to unmute everybody who is on the call. Um, and I would love for us to give, um, see if we can get Tomas a quick um, thank you and goodbye. Or if you guys can unmute, um, unmute your, if all our students can unmute your students, let's give him a quick goodbye and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is awesome. Um, thank you guys. Thank you. And we will see you next week. Can I say something real quick? Yep. Kim? Okay. One more. Yep. Final thoughts from yep. Tomas. The last, 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 last thought. Yeah. The big takeaway from this project that I want you to take away, which was the big lesson that I learned, is that when you see these big, massive movements of people and all these different big events that happen, you know, uh, and you might that indicates that the news indicates you to make you feel a certain way, or at least they don't tell you what are the particularities of these people. Um, in this case of migration, uh, of all these asylum seekers coming to uh, crossing borders, it's, uh, I suggest that you find work that lets you understand them better because it's only through empathy and understanding and an emotional understanding of all these different people who have such such trauma that I think that we will be able to fully uh, advance as societies to better understand each other, Honduras and America and uh, from different communities within the, the, the United States. So be kind, be, be patient and be empathetic and you will find yourself likely with a new respect and oftentimes new friends. There is no better way to end a session with, than the, with those amazing words. Thank you guys. Thank you to everyone. Special thank you to Tomas. We'll see you next week.